This investigation is sponsored by Audible. Also, Mr. Mythos Face Reveal in 3, 2, 1. This is a question that stuck with me since I first heard it. Could an ancient advanced civilization live in secret within a network of cave systems deep underground? This concept is known as Inner Earth, and there's a surprising number of ancient stories and occult beliefs revolving around these hidden subterranean realms. Today we'll be diving into three truly bizarre Inner Earth conspiracy theories, which I've had countless requests to investigate. A secret society that harnessed a limitless energy source from an underground alien colony. A Nazi megabase hidden deep beneath Antarctica that still operates to this day. And a famous American explorer who flew into an inner earth entrance by accident and documented this world firsthand. Hey fellow seekers, welcome. I'm Mr. Mythos. If you're a fan of strange and ancient mysteries with research so deep you're guaranteed to fall down the rabbit hole, you're in the right place. I humbly ask that you give this video a like and ding the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the rare info we'll be digging into every Saturday. As usual, we won't set out to debunk or prove. Rather, we'll be looking at the available evidence for each theory, and at the end, whether or not you believe these conspiracies are true is up to you. But before we get into it, you guys are probably wondering, what's on my sweater? Here, let me show you. Those who don't read have no advantage over those who can't, and that's a quote from Mark Twain. I think it's important to read, but I have a secret. Most of the time I'm reading through my ears, using Audible, when I'm cooking, walking my cat, doing chores, all that. They've got thousands of audiobooks, as well as original programs, and right now I'm listening to Secret Bases of the Inner Earth by Valiant Thor, a big inspiration for this video, by the way. It's filled with wild conspiracies. I mean, even the author is supposed to be an alien from Venus living in the Pentagon. Like, no joke, Valiant Thor is a pretty well-known name in the UFO community. I definitely recommend you give it a listen through Audible, and I've got a killer holiday deal for you all. Go to audible.com slash Mr. Mythos, or text Mr. Mythos to 500-500 for 60% off your first three months. All right. It's time for some inner earth conspiracies, and where better to begin than the infamous Vril Society? The Vril Society was a secret occult group that may have existed in Germany both before and during Hitler's Third Reich regime, and this alleged society supposedly had massive influence on the rise of Nazism, possibly even driving its entire ideology. Oddly enough, the beliefs and objectives of this Vril Society were supposedly based upon a novel written by Edward Bulwer Lytton, an author now most famous for the saying, the pen is mightier than the sword, and the opening line, it was a dark and stormy night. In 1870, he published The Coming Race, which was a science fiction novel that described an inner earth civilization of angel-like superhumans known as the Vril Yaw and their limitless energy source, which was simply called Vril. This energy source was so powerful that their entire underground utopian society was built upon it. Vril could be materialized as a sort of liquid, and the Vril Yaw could control Vril with their minds. For what sounds like classic science fiction, as the author Bulwer Lytton publicly claimed it was, many weren't so sure. In particular, the influential occultists Helena Blavatsky, William Scott Elliot, and Rudolf Steiner argued that the ideas were based upon truths and hidden knowledge revealed to Lytton. This was perhaps because Lytton was a high-ranking member of several major secret societies. This same belief was also supposedly shared by members of a highly secret occult sect known as the Vril Society, many of whom were part of Nazi High Command. We'll get back to the Vril Society in a minute, but first, let's talk about the concepts in Bulwer Lytton's novel, The Coming Race. The book begins by introducing the narrator, a young, wealthy, and anonymous man who visits a friend who is a mining engineer. Together they venture into a mine shaft and explore a natural chasm that had recently been exposed. 
Going in, the friend falls and dies, but the narrator survives. He eventually realizes that this is much more than a cave. He discovers that he had fallen into an ancient hidden world. After a while, he meets the people of Inner Earth, the Vril Ya. These beings live in a classless utopia, having transcended war and politics. But the flip side is that, even though they've surpassed the problems of humanity, they've also lost the ability to feel empathy. And this is a big problem, because the Vroya are becoming overpopulated, and soon they'll need to emerge from their inner earth home to claim territory on the surface, using a weaponized version of their infinite power source, Vril. So what exactly is Vril? In The Coming Race, Bulber Litton gives a strikingly long and complex description of this free energy source, comparing it to electricity blended with other forces of nature, such as magnetism. Unlike electricity though, Vril is materialized as a liquid, and is through manipulation of this liquid that the Vril Yaw are able to communicate with the narrator. Just to comprehend the sheer power of Vril, the use of a single drop can dramatically influence the weather, as well as one's thoughts, feelings, and desires, the movement of our bodies, and even the growth of vegetation. And obviously, it can be used as a weapon, too. Interestingly though, the power of Vril is apparently not equal between people, but primarily a hereditary trait, passed down by genetics. Lytton explains that a four-year-old girl of the Vril Ya could accomplish far greater feats the first time she tried than the strongest and most skilled Vril practitioner who was not naturally gifted. So where did this hereditary power come from, and how did they end up living underground in the first place? Well, the Vril Ya claimed to be descendants of an ancient civilization called Anna who lived in a network of caverns linked by tunnels. The Anna were originally surface dwellers, but fled underground thousands of years ago to escape some massive cataclysm on the surface, presumably some great flood. Something to note is that all of Bulber Lytton's descriptions of the Vril Ya are lengthy and complex, and not so fantastical. He goes through great lengths to describe centuries of Vril Ya history, governance, educational institutions, economic classes, laws, customs, and even their religion, which acknowledges the existence of a higher being. While most people might think this is great world building for a fantasy novel, these details seemingly matched a number of ancient and secret occult beliefs to such an extent that the world's most influential occultists began to believe that Lytton wasn't exactly writing fiction. To fully understand the conspiracy of the Vril Ya and a real-life Vril society, we need to investigate Edward Bulwer Lytton a little more closely, and particularly his involvement in a secret society known as the Golden Dawn. So, in 1885, a group of influential members of British society formed the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The Golden Dawn was limited to 144 members, including the President of the Royal Academy, Sir Gerald Kelly, the author of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the Nobel Prize winner, William Butler Yeats, who served as Chief Magician. And one of the Golden Dawn's most prominent members was our friend, Edward Bulwer Lytton. Despite being comprised of great leaders and thinkers, the Golden Dawn held some peculiar beliefs. Most relevantly, the Golden Dawn's founder, Samuel Mathers, swore that he maintained contact with a group of superior beings. In a letter to Golden Dawn members, Mathers described these superhumans, and I quote, As to the secret chiefs with whom I am in touch with, and from whom I have received the wisdom of the Second Order which I communicated to you, I can tell you nothing. I do not even know their earthly names, and I have very seldom seen them in their physical bodies. They used to meet me physically at a time and place established in advance. As for me, I believe they are human beings living on this earth, but endowed with terrible supernatural powers. My meetings with them have shown me how difficult it is for a mortal man, however advanced, to be in their presence. 
I don't mean that during my rare encounters with them that I experienced the same feeling of intense physical depression that is accompanied by the loss of magnetism. On the contrary, I felt I was before a force so great that I can only compare it with the shock one would receive by being close to a flash of lightning during a great thunderstorm and at the same time experiencing great difficulty in breathing. The nervous symptoms I spoke of were accompanied by the cold sweats, bleeding from the mouth, nose, and sometimes the ears." End quote. Note that Bulwer Lytton's description of the Vroya is rather similar to that given by Samuel Mathers, so we might assume that Lytton took inspiration directly from Mathers. However, Mathers released his statement in 1896, 25 years after the publication of The Coming Race. So, how does a Golden Dawn tie into the supposed formation of the Viral Society? Well, the Golden Dawn was known to maintain communication with multiple cult groups in other countries, especially Germany. More importantly, however, was one of their earliest members, Karl Haushofer a professor at the University of Munich. For whatever reason, nobody really talks about Karl Haushofer today, but he may have had serious influence on Adolf Hitler. Some people even think Haushofer assisted in writing the Nazi manifesto, Mein Kampf. This theory comes from the fact that the two maintained contact from the early days, with Haushofer visiting Hitler while he was in prison in Munich in 1923. In fact, Haushofer was the mentor and teacher of the future deputy Führer of the Third Reich, Rudolf Hess. If the Vril Society existed, it was likely founded by Karl Haushofer, and this is indeed the leading theory. Now, Nazi occult lore was no stranger to ideas of superpowered beings. In fact, according to Nazi mythology, the Aryan race descended from extraterrestrials who visited Earth thousands of years ago. These aliens supposedly formed a colony deep within Inner Earth, which we'll get to in a bit. This of course goes in line with the story told in The Coming Race, which finally leads us to the Vril Society. The Vril Society is an alleged group of German nationalists who, with all seriousness, believe their ancestors to actually be the Vril Ja, and experimented with techniques to harness the limitless power of Vril. Widespread speculation of the existence of this Vril Society only really occurred after World War II ended, where both pro- and anti-Hitler writers theorized that the Vril Society engineered the rise of the Nazi party. Vril energy supposedly powered secret Nazi technologies, and people theorized that Vril-powered UFOs allowed Hitler to escape to Antarctica, deep beneath the Earth, in a secret base where he then plotted his Vril powered return. Though this might sound a bit super villainy, there could be some truth to it, if you're willing to consider the possibilities. Returning back to Karl Haushofer, he supposedly founded this organization in 1919, first calling it the Brothers of the Light Society, until he changed the name. Their practice was largely based on the rites of Theosophy, Rosicrucianism, and Hermeticism but with an added focus on the magical powers of the Vroya race, who they believed to have descended from. The Vril Society believed that whoever could control Vril would become master of themselves, as well as everyone around them, and possibly even dominate the entire world. They related Vril to other ancient occult energy concepts such as Chi, believing it to literally have the power to transform an ordinary mortal into a superhuman. Besides Karl Haushofer, another central member of the group was said to be Maria Orsic, a woman closely connected with the Thule Society, one of Nazi Germany's confirmed occult orders. Orsic's primary efforts were directed at uniting the Thule and Vril societies for an expedition to locate the Vril energy source deep within the Earth, and use it to build a disc-shaped craft, the first Nazi UFO. Indeed, the most prominent thought is that the Vril Society was tasked by the Nazis to build flying saucers to fight in World War II, and some believe that they accomplished this task, perhaps a bit late, 
and that these virile powered crafts carried key members of the Nazi party to Antarctica, South America, inner earth, and even outer space as Germany was defeated. Let's step back for a moment though and take a closer look at Maria Orsic, because she is such a central figure of the mythology of the Vril Society, and a woman Hitler allegedly called his Aryan Goddess. In fact, if she actually existed as legends dictate, her teachings may have been what Hitler used to justify the actions of the Third Reich. Maria Orsic was first mentioned in the seminal 1960 work, The Morning of the Magicians, which recorded that she was born on October 31, 1895 in Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. In her teenage years, she discovered that she had certain powers. She began to be contacted by beings seemingly from other dimensions, other planets, and yes, even beneath the surface of the earth and she used this ability to become a powerful psychic medium. As a young woman, Orsic followed the German national movement and eventually moved to Munich with her fiancé. It was there that her fame grew, and eventually she was contacted by the Thule Society who employed her as a medium. In 1924, during a fairly standard seance in which she tried to connect with the spirit of the dead German poet and politician Dietrich Eckhart, her body became possessed by something else, and she transmitted a message that shocked the entire room. Orsic's possessor revealed that in the constellation Taurus, there was a bright star named Aldebaran, which made up the left eye of Taurus the Bull. Circling this star was a planet named Bumi, apparently inhabited by the progenitors of the original Aryan race. These ultra-advanced aliens were said to be tall, white-skinned, with blue eyes and blonde hair. Some 11,000 years ago, the Bumi civilization stumbled upon a wormhole, a rift in space that allowed them to travel to our own solar system. After this, Bumi travelers presumably landed on Earth and established a secret colony in a massive, deep cavern somewhere beneath Antarctica. Now, the females of Bumi had an interesting tradition. These alien women would grow their hair extremely long because their hair literally acted as an antenna, transmitting telecommunications directly from and into their brain. This allowed the Bumi colonists to maintain communication with their home world, as well as transmit messages to powerful mediums such as Maria Orsic herself. At the end of their message, these aliens supposedly passed along detailed schematics to Orsic, for the construction of a spaceship capable of interdimensional jumps, powered of course by Vril. Those who witnessed the possession of Orsic were absolutely convinced of its authenticity, including Rudolf Hess, the future right hand of Hitler. These blueprints she provided led to the gradual construction of what was codenamed the Munich device, the first Nazi spaceship which was believed to be completed in 1943. Okay. So what does all this have to do with the Vril Society? Well, this is where conspiracy theories get rather confusing because not only is it not clear who established the Vril Society in the first place, but also what exactly it was. I'll tell you right off the bat, if it existed, the objective of the Vril Society was to locate Vril in the center of the earth so that it could evolve those who mastered it, as well as harness it as a free energy source. This much is consistent. We already explored the idea of Karl Haushofer founding this society as essentially an offshoot of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, but many others believe that it was actually Maria Orsic who founded the Vril Society as a special inner circle of the Thule Society. This theory tells that Orsic was a strong feminist and wanted to demonstrate the innate power of Aryan women similar to the story of the Bumi females whose role was so vital to the Bumi colony here on Earth. With several of her female friends, they founded the Vril Society, a group of all women who grew extremely long hair and tied them into horse tails, which was an uncommon hairstyle at the time, and became a distinctive characteristic of women who had forged a connection with Vril energy. However, the fate of Maria Orsic changed forever when Adolf Hitler entered the picture. 
Not only did he accept her stories of the Bumi people as fact, believing them to be progenitors of the Aryan race, but he wanted Orsic to use her long hair to continually communicate with the Bumi aliens and extract more blueprints for advanced technology and weaponry. Maria Orsic was apparently frightened by Hitler's extremism, but for her own safety she cooperated. However, in 1945, when it was clear that the Third Reich would fail, Orsic disappeared and was never heard from again. There are theories that Orsic and her Vril associates secretly boarded their ship, the Munich device, and left Earth for the Aldebaran solar system, or that she traveled into Inner Earth, where the Bumi colony apparently still existed beneath Antarctica. But the real conspiracy that most theorists are concerned with isn't the fate of Maria Orsic, but the cover-up of her historical existence, and that of the Vril Society's accomplishments. If the Vril Society existed, just as this long string of stories, legends, and Nazi mythology tell, perhaps Vril Free Energy could still be in the possession of the nations that came out on top of World War II. Regardless, there is some indication that this rumored group actually did exist. And ironically, some of the strongest evidence comes from the magazine Astounding Science Fiction. In an article written by the German rocket scientist William Ley in 1947, just two years after Germany's surrender, here's what Ley wrote. That group, which I think called itself Wahrheit's Gesellschaft, or the Society for Truth, and which was more or less localized in Berlin, devoted its spare time looking for Vril. Yes, their convictions were founded upon Boer Litton's The Coming Race. They knew that the book was fiction, but believed Boer Litton had used that device in order to be able to tell the truth about this power. End quote. That being said, the strongest proof, in my opinion, was the discovery of a pamphlet by the German author Peter Bonn. This pamphlet is dated to 1930 and was published by the influential astrologer Otto Wilhelm Barth. It was titled Vril, the Cosmic Elementary Power. That's an English translation, of course, the entire document is in German. In its 60 pages, it only has one short mention of this obscure esoteric group, stating that the Vril Society was founded in 1925 to study the uses of Vril energy. Therefore, this pamphlet pretty much confirms that some Vril Society did exist in Germany and predated Hitler's regime. That leads us to our next question. Just how much influence did the real Vril Society have on Adolf Hitler? It's somewhat well known that much of Hitler's Third Reich was inspired by occult lore, with Inner Earth being a particular interest. Hitler ordered teams of geographers and scientists to find tunnel entrances that led into Inner Earth and countless German, Swiss, and Italian mines were charted for shafts leading to hidden cavern cities, much like the story told in The Coming Race. In fact, Hitler was quite a fan of the book. He even ordered one of his trusted men to investigate the author Edward Bulwer Lytton's life in an attempt to figure out where and when Lytton had visited the realm of the Vroja. Beyond that, there were also several parallels between Hitler's politics and that of the Vril Yaw. For example, in the coming race, the Vril Yaw considered democracy and free institutions to be an ignorant and backwards approach to governance, and put emphasis on what was essentially dictatorship. In turn, Hitler argued that dictatorship was the only intelligent way to rule a modern nation. In another example, the Vroja used children for observation at watch posts, and Hitler was known for using boys and girls as the eyes and ears of the Nazi party. These children would turn over their parents and relatives to the authorities if they spoke against the regime. Like the Vroja, Hitler believed that children could be ruthless when manipulated. So was Hitler a member of the Vril Society? It's possible. And if this conspiracy theory is true, then maybe others are worth considering as well. Some people say that the first successful Vril-powered flying craft was Maria Orsic's 
Munich device, which eventually led to the creation of an experimental military vehicle known as Die Glocke, or the Bell, which was believed to have been built in 1944 in a huge underground laboratory inside the Wenceslas mine in the Sudeten Mountains of Poland. But perhaps no virile powered theory is more prominent than the virile society's alleged escape to a secret underground base in Antarctica when Germany surrendered, and with them they supposedly brought many high ranking Nazi officials and their very best scientists. Perhaps even Hitler himself escaped with them. After all, one of the scant few pieces of evidence we have that Hitler died in 1945 is a skull fragment found at the scene, which in 2009 was DNA tested to have actually belonged to a woman. To set the scene, imagine this. Berlin has crumbled by the weight of hundreds of bombs and the Allied forces are making their final move. Underground in his bunker, Adolf Hitler finally admits defeat in his quest for Nazi world domination, but he'll never allow himself to be captured alive. There's only one option left, one that Hitler had long planned for. Together with his closest comrades, the Fuhrer travels through a deep tunnel and emerges at a hidden airstrip with a virile powered craft waiting for them. They board this flying saucer and take off headed toward the South Pole where they'd established an underground base. There the Nazis would become a breakaway civilization, connected to the same tunnels inhabited by the Bumi alien colony, or possibly even the civilization of the Vro Ya. Now, we should ask, how realistic is it that Hitler may have considered Inner Earth as an escape plan? As a man who boasted that the Third Reich would endure for a thousand years, and surpass the splendor of all other nations in history. You'd think he would have invested in a solid backup plan so that his utopian vision could survive in the event that not all went according to plan during war. And perhaps he did. Allow me to introduce the conspiracy theory that the Third Reich survived as an inner earth breakaway society beneath Antarctica. And there are some pretty weird events connected to this one, so buckle up. To begin, it's clear that some top-ranking Nazis believed in the existence of Inner Earth, and being that supreme beings apparently chose to live down there, perhaps the Nazi survivors could thrive there too. On August 10th, 1944, a secret meeting of top German industrialists, bankers and politicians was held. At this point it had become obvious that Germany was going to lose the war, so this meeting put an operation codenamed Odessa into motion. The purpose of Odessa was to establish a network of escape routes and ensure a secure future for the Nazis. This was a 100% real operation by the way, there's no conspiracy here. Odessa allowed countless high ranking officials to essentially disappear from the face of the earth, and at the end of World War II, only a handful of these high rankers stood trial. More than that, after the war, the Allies discovered that more than 2,000 German scientists had gone missing. As a very highly funded covert operation, Odessa remains mysterious as to just how far they went to make these people completely vanish. Thus, many claim that Odessa could have built a secret underground Nazi base beneath the South Pole, where Hitler and other missing Nazis could have escaped. And theoretically, this breakaway society could still be there today. Note that Antarctica was definitely an ideal location as it was one of the few areas in the oceans without a strong allied military presence. That being said, here is a leading theory as to how the Nazis came to settle in the South Pole. In 1938, the Nazis sent an expedition to the Queen Maud Land region of Antarctica, and while they were mapping the area, they discovered a massive complex of caves. After exploring their way deep underground, they eventually reached a cavern large enough to host an entire city, and they decided that this location, above all others, was perfect to set up a secret base. Now it's thought that as they established themselves here, they sent expedition teams deeper through this cave system, so 
presumably they could have made contact with the Boomi aliens who also reside beneath Antarctica, or discovered some of their technology. Or perhaps the Nazis were alone, but with their best engineers, they invented many advanced weapons and vehicles in the space. Though it may sound like a real stretch, again, there are some very odd details that have led to the formation of this conspiracy theory. First off, it's a fact that the Nazis set up many secret bases in highly remote locations, and some of these are only recently being found. As an example, in 2016, Russian researchers discovered a Nazi base, codenamed Treasure Hunter, in the Arctic. So it's entirely possible that they could have set up a secret base in the Antarctic too. On top of this, the Nazis actually did send an expedition to Antarctica in 1938, in a vessel named Schwabenland, just a few months before World War II broke up. There they explored the western region of Queen Maudland, so this actually did happen. Even more, the world was puzzled when Nazi Germany agreed to the Antarctic Treaty, which made Antarctica a research zone and stated that it could not be targeted by bombs or missiles. For a long time, political historians have wondered why the Nazis signed this treaty. According to the conspiracy, it was to deter other nations from testing nuclear weapons in Antarctica and accidentally vaporizing their secret base. Then there are the alleged statements made by the German admiral, Karl Dönitz, who briefly succeeded Hitler after Germany's surrender. I couldn't locate any original sources for these statements, so please take them with a grain of salt. In 1943, Dönitz apparently stated that, quote, the German submarine fleet is proud of having built for the Fuhrer in another part of the world a Shangri-La on land, an impregnable fortress. End quote. And during his trial in 1946, Dunit supposedly boasted about an quote, invulnerable fortress, a paradise-like oasis in the middle of eternal ice. End quote. Finally, there is the mystery of the two U-boats, U-530 and U-977, which arrived at Mar del Plata in Argentina just two months after Germany's surrender in 1945. The two crews were interrogated upon their arrival, and allegedly they disclosed that the Germans had built massive subterranean complexes beneath Antarctica. More than that, these U-boats were the ones used to drop off Hitler and other Nazi officials at the South Pole to secure their safety. Looking at the timeline of two months, these U-boats could have believably traveled from Germany to Antarctica, and then to Argentina in that time. Now, let me ask you, if you were the Allied forces and you heard from credible sources that there was a surviving Nazi base in Antarctica, would you launch efforts to find and destroy it? Well, that's apparently what happened, possibly even twice. We'll begin with the Americans and Operation High Jump, which launched in 1946, less than a year after the two U-boats were captured in Argentina. Operation High Jump was the largest expedition ever made to Antarctica, with over 4,700 men, 33 aircraft, and 13 ships. Most importantly, however, High Jump was not a scientific expedition, but a military operation. It was organized by Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, a very important person who we'll get into much deeper in the third and final theory. So, what was the purpose of Operation High Jump? Well, officially it was to establish an Antarctic research base. That then raises a question. Why were so many military vehicles and weapons necessary? Moreover, Operation High Jump was supposed to last eight months, but the expedition was terminated a month early for reasons that would never officially be disclosed to the public. These mysteries lead into some pretty strange theories as to what actually occurred during High Jump. If we are to continue with the Nazi base theory, allegedly Admiral Byrd's aerial reconnaissance located the German base and bombed it to oblivion. But in another version of the tale, four of Admiral Byrd's aircraft were shot down by UFOs, or advanced Nazi weapons. Less than 48 hours after, Admiral Byrd gave orders to cancel the expedition and withdraw. 
This event was apparently recorded in a European periodical known as Brissant. But what if High Jump wasn't the first attack launched on this inner earth Nazi base? Far more secretive and obscure than Operation High Jump was the earlier British wartime Antarctic operation, codenamed Tabern. Operation Tabern was executed by the Royal Navy and the Special Air Services Regiment. Even to this day, little is known about this regiment, the Special Air Services, as most documentation on them and their activities remains confidential. Operation Tabern lasted between 1943 and 1945, and its purpose was to establish a permanent presence in Antarctica, Argentina, and Chile to monitor Nazi activity. And in Antarctica, the British successfully established multiple secret bases throughout the continent. Here's where the details get murky though. Though it's true that most documentation on Operation Tabern remains secret, alleged former members of the Special Air Services Regiment have come out to reveal details of a battle that occurred in 1945 when the Nazis discovered one of these secret British bases. This siege apparently lasted multiple months until the Special Air Services arrived and rescued it around Christmas. After this occurred, the British scoured the land and discovered the secret subterranean megabase of the Nazis and launched a counterattack. To add to this is a mind-boggling statement given in 2005 by the alleged last survivor of the siege, which I'll be paraphrasing. Quote, the base was in a vast underground cavern that was warmed geothermally. In the huge cavern were underground lakes. The Nazis had constructed a huge base into the caverns and had even built docks for U-boats. Hangars for strange planes and excavations galore had been documented. The power that the Nazis were utilizing was by volcanic activity, which gave them heat for steam and also helped them produce electricity. We were overwhelmed by the numbers of personnel scurrying about like ants. Huge constructions were being built. The Nazis, it appeared, had been on Antarctica a long time. This statement was given to James Roberts, a civil servant of the UK's Ministry of Defence, who then released it to the public, keeping the survivor's identity anonymous. This description of the Nazis' inner earth base is interesting as it talks about a reliance on volcanic activity, which is actually not too far from the idea of Vril. Vril is supposedly a liquid and a near-infinite energy source that comes from the centre of the earth. That pretty much sounds like the massive molten lava pockets we find deep underground. But could the Nazis have harnessed the power of the Earth's core in this way? Who knows? German engineers have a long-standing reputation for their scientific leaps and insane experiments, especially those that occurred during World War II. And it's thought that the Nazis could have continued refining these technologies if and when they relocated beneath Antarctica bringing with them legendary Wunderwaffe, which is a German word translating to wonder weapons. The Wunderwaffe are a theoretical set of secret Nazi technologies, such as directed energy weapons, as well as the Die Glocke, the bizarre bell-shaped device I mentioned earlier, which many consider to be an experimental flying saucer powered by Vril or some other occult magic. Rumors that these technologies were shipped to safety in the Antarctic circulated during the 1950s, and in the 1970s, neo-Nazis placed their bets that a massive and advanced Antarctic military force was being assembled, and they called this the Last Battalion. This is said to be the reason why Antarctica is a hot spot of UFO activity. Many people genuinely believe that the Nazis could still be there today, flying their Vril-powered crafts and plotting the Fourth Reich. On the note of UFOs, the Admiral I mentioned earlier, Richard Byrd, became quite well known for an odd statement he made about his experience during Operation High Jump. This occurred during an interview with international news service correspondent Lee Van Atta aboard the USS Mount Olympus, and this statement was later published in the March 1947 issue of El Mercurio, a Chilean newspaper. 
The translated text is as follows. Admiral Byrd declared today that it was imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defense measures against hostile regions. The Admiral further stated that he didn't want to frighten anyone unduly, but that it was a bitter reality that, in case of a new war, the continental United States would be attacked by flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Admiral Byrd repeated the above points of view, resulting from his personal knowledge gathered at both the North and South Poles, before a news conference held for International News Service. End quote. So, what flying objects was Byrd talking about? Flying objects that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. That certainly doesn't sound like any known aircraft available in the 40s, let alone in modern day. Could these have been the Nazi UFOs which allegedly took out four of his planes? This interview is genuine, though it was never published in English. Some believe it was suppressed by the American government. Interestingly, the newspaper that published it, El Mercurio, is believed to have served as a CIA front organization during the 1970s. I mentioned earlier that we dive deeper into Admiral Byrd, and that's because he's the central figure of perhaps the most famous inner earth conspiracy of all time. I'm talking about the secret diary of Admiral Richard E. Byrd. This lost flight log and journal which surfaced in 1984 is surrounded by conspiracy and even a couple mysterious deaths, and it records his own alleged encounter with an inner earth civilization. Now, this is a conspiracy that I've been asked to cover more times than I can count in pretty much every Inner Earth video I make. Did Admiral Byrd discover an entrance to Inner Earth in 1947, and was this event covered up by the American government? Admiral Richard E. Byrd is considered to be the greatest polar explorer of the 20th century after conducting flight missions to both the North and South Poles in 1926 and 1929 respectively. For his bravery in exploring these isolated lands, he was awarded the Medal of Honor, which is the highest honor for valor given in the United States. He was by all accounts a true American hero with a strong reputation for honesty, which is why some of his public statements after his journeys raised eyebrows. For example, after his flight to Antarctica, he commented on having seen, quote, a land of blue and green lakes and brown hills in an otherwise limitless expanse of ice. And after his flight to the Arctic, he said, quote, I'd like to see that land past the North Pole. It is the center of the great unknown. If we couple these statements with his warning of what seemed to be UFOs after Operation High Jump, you can see how the official narrative begins to get pretty questionable. To this day, many records and flight logs written by Byrd remain either lost or confidential, and one of these documents was his so-called Secret Diary, which documented in shocking detail his descent into Inner Earth and his meeting with a race of superior beings very closely similar to those described by Edward Bower lytton and Maria Orsic. This diary came into the possession of a man by the pseudonym of Ritter von X the shadowy head of a secretive sect known as the International Society for Complete Earth. The entire purpose of this group was to investigate the existence of an advanced inner earth civilization. Ritter von X is an interesting character due to his claimed background. As a former Nazi, he was supposedly born in Berlin, Germany and joined the Kriegsmarine, which was the German Navy in 1943. Most curiously, however, Von X claimed to have served on the U-530, which was one of the U-boats that arrived in Mar del Plata in Argentina, as mentioned earlier in our investigation of the Nazi breakaway conspiracy. Von X was apparently captured by the Allies when his crew surrendered, then forced to participate in a secret mission to retrieve one of Hitler's legendary treasures, the Lance of Longinus which is the spear that pierced Jesus Christ through the ribs during his crucifixion. 
afterward, Von Eck became an American citizen and supposedly became involved in multiple other secret missions to Antarctica. How Ritter Von Eck came into possession of the secret diary of Admiral Byrd, no one knows, but there are some truly strange mysteries surrounding this one, so let's get right into the text. Admiral Richard E. Byrd begins his diary with the following. I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It concerns my Antarctic flight of the 19th day of February in the year of 1947. There comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance and one must accept the inevitability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record here for all to read one day." End quote. The first half of the diary reads mostly in timed entries, spanning hours to mere minutes. It begins as a normal flight log, but quickly takes a turn for the strange. Quote, 1005 hours. I alter altitude to 1400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. Decrease altitude to a thousand feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. End quote. A half hour passes and Bird sees rolling green hills and his external temperature gauge reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty darn hot for Antarctica. It's at this point his radio stops functioning. Another hour passes and he can see what seems to be a city in the distance and his writing becomes more frantic. It's at this point he loses control of his aircraft. Here's what Bird writes. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My god! Off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. After this, Admiral Byrd's aircraft is commandeered into inner earth by these UFOs. Note that though these flying saucers are apparently marked by a type of swastika, these inner earth beings don't seem to be part of the Third Reich breakaway civilization or connected to the Nazis in any distinguishable way. I guess if one considers that the swastika is possibly the most ancient and widely found religious symbol in history, and these inner earth beings are supposedly an extremely ancient race, then it wouldn't be too crazy to see swastikas on their craft, but I digress. Moving on, Bird makes his final log, quote, 1145 hours. I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall, with blonde hair. In the distance is a large, shimmering city, pulsating with rainbow hues of color." End quote. At this point, the diary's writing switches from real-time logs to events written from memory. Admiral Byrd and his radio man exit the aircraft and are greeted by these tall, blonde inner-earth beings who are pretty much identical to the boomy aliens described by Maria Orsic. These beings then escort them to a glowing crystal city in the far distance. In this city, he is brought to a being called the Master, who introduces the inner earth people as an ancient race called the Orini. The Master claims that the Orini are protectors of planet earth, and that they are well aware of what goes on on the surface world and are constantly monitoring our activities and development. The Master then expresses that this event was planned, and that Admiral Byrd was specifically chosen for his high-trusted status in the military, 
so that he may act as their ambassador and pass along an important message. This message was one of concern. Specifically, the Orini had grave fears of humanity's invention of atomic weapons. This is what the Master told Admiral Byrd. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist." End quote. After this warning was given, Bird and his crew were escorted back to their plane and guided back to the outer surface of the earth. A month then passes and Admiral Byrd ends his diary with a final entry. March 11, 1947 I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the Master. All is duly recorded. The President has been advised. I am now detained for several hours, 6 hours 39 minutes to be exact. I am interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of this United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on the behalf of humanity. Incredible. I am reminded that I am a military man and I must obey orders." End quote. Okay, so the first thing we should note regarding this alleged secret diary is the flight log is dated to 1947, which is the year that Operation High Jump occurred at the South Pole. Most conspiracy theorists online seem to believe that the journal covers his journey to the North Pole, but that occurred 21 years earlier, in 1926. So just note that this journey, if it actually happened, has to be referring to the events that occurred during Byrd's participation in Operation High Jump. The man behind the scenes of Operation High Jump, as well as Admiral Byrd's direct superior, was Admiral James Forrestal, the then Secretary of the US Navy. We'll be getting into his story in a second. It wasn't long after this alleged inner earth abduction that Admiral Byrd ordered the premature termination of Operation High Jump, and afterward, Byrd returned back to Washington, D.C. to report directly to Admiral Forrestal. There's two fun facts to note before we move on. First, in July of 1947 was the famous UFO crash that occurred at Roswell, New Mexico. Second, in that same year, President Harry S. Truman allegedly founded the Majestic 12, a secret group of military officials and scientists whose purpose was to control and monitor the UFO agenda. It's just interesting we keep being drawn back to this year, 1947. Now, about Admiral James Forrestal, who I mentioned Admiral Byrd reported to. Forrestal was the Secretary of the Navy and later the first United States Secretary of Defense, making him one of the highest ranking officials in American history. He was also an alleged founding member of the Majestic 12. Admiral Forrestal is unfortunately remembered today for his dramatic and highly mysterious death when he suddenly leapt from the 16th floor of a hospital in 1949, just two years after Operation High Jump. To be honest, Forrestal's death is one of the more thoroughly believable conspiracy theories that I've researched, all inner earth theories aside, and once you hear the sequence of events and circumstances, I bet you'll feel similarly. Just weeks before his death, President Truman abruptly removed Forrestal from office, ending his status as a government employee. And soon after, Forrestal apparently suffered an extreme case of physical and mental exhaustion and couldn't move, after which he was swiftly flown on a Navy airplane to Florida, where he was diagnosed with severe depression. 
He was then flown to the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, where he was seemingly kept against his will for a period of more than seven weeks on the 16th floor. What's a big red flag here is that James Forrestal was no longer a government employee, so it's really unclear why he was being cared for at a military facility. Before he jumped from the 16th floor to his death, he left no suicide note but only a half-copied poem from the ancient Greek tragedy Ajax. At least this was what was reported by the official press, but no photos or evidence of this half-copied poem were ever provided. Even stranger was that the official Navy investigation of his death only reported that Forrestal died from a fall from the window. There was nothing on what might have caused the fall, and no mention of the bathrobe sash cord that the official press announcement said was tied around his neck. In fact, one of the biggest proponents of the James Forrestal death conspiracy was his own brother, Henry Forrestal. Henry released multiple statements that his brother would have never taken his own life, and that Admiral Forrestal was feeling good talking about the future with him just days before the incident. Henry remarked on the prison-like conditions of his brother's hospital room and how the hospital staff constantly interfered in visitations and attempted to keep Admiral Forrestal isolated. Henry was also troubled by how quickly Navy officials insisted that Forrestal's death was suicide, with no consideration of the possibility of murder and no police investigation. Most concerningly, Henry was scheduled to escort his brother to leave the hospital just hours before his death. Many people speculate that the reason why Admiral James Forrestal could have been assassinated was that he was preparing to release information related to Admiral Burr's journey into Inner Earth, or possibly the Nazi encounter during Operation High Jump. If the truth of Inner Earth was being covered up by the American government, and perhaps every major nation, then Forrestal would have been a prime target due to being a powerful and respected man as well as Admiral Byrd's direct superior, thus having knowledge of everything Byrd saw and experienced. And get this, James Forrestal is not the only suspicious death connected to Admiral Byrd's Antarctic expedition. In October of 1988, the corpse of what appeared to be an old homeless man was found in a vacant warehouse in Baltimore, Maryland. Tests showed that he had died of malnutrition and dehydration, but more shockingly, they revealed his identity. The dead man was Richard Byrd Jr., a Harvard graduate, father of four, and the only son of Admiral Richard E. Byrd. How Byrd's son ended up dying in a remote warehouse was a complete mystery, and the events of the last three weeks of his life remain unknown. He didn't have any problems with drugs or drinking, and by all accounts he was an accomplished, stable, and well-off man. The only real clue we have is that, less than a month before, Richard Byrd Jr. left his home in Boston by train and was headed to a ceremony in Washington, D.C. to honor his father's polar accomplishments. Unfortunately, he would never make it to the event. Richard Byrd Jr.'s sons were quick to point out that Byrd Jr. idolized his father, and in particular, he was always drawn back to a certain expedition to the South Pole that occurred in the 1940s, in which he accompanied his father to Antarctica. Keeping dates in mind, it was only four years before Byrd Jr.'s highly mysterious death that Ritter Von X released the secret diary of Admiral Byrd to the world. So we really have to wonder, was Byrd Jr. the one who gave Von X the secret diary of his beloved father, the one that revealed the reality of Inner Earth? After all, who else but Admiral Byrd's only son would have possession of such a private and monumental document? If, of course, the conspiracy is true. Admittedly, these stories and theories of inner earth conspiracies are quite the trip. Many people seriously believe in the possibility of a hidden inner earth civilization complete with godlike people and hyper advanced technology. And what can I say? Inner Earth continues to maintain its allure. You'll find connections everywhere, 
especially if you watch my previous documentaries on the subject, which I definitely recommend you check out, and I'll include those links in the description. By the way, I've got a long list of inner earth conspiracy theories that I'd love to dive into with you all, so please let me know in the comments if you want me to continue this series. Finally, if you're new to the channel, I really appreciate you giving me a chance to entertain and inform, and if you're a longtime fan, you're probably wondering what's up with this new video style. Well, I'm going to try this out for a while, and I'm hoping that this format will allow me to release content way more often as well as create way longer videos, as I know you guys love how deep I get into these subjects. So let me know what you think, and stay tuned because I got another one of these deep dives coming next Saturday. Huge thank you to my patrons. I'm Mr. Mythos. You guys are awesome. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.